an addition to the agenda this morning, we have a delegation, um, Mr. Jonathan Clarkson from the uh, Nighthawk. And uh, so if there are no objections, we will start with the presentation from Mr. Clarkson. Are you there, Jonathan? I am, Clyde. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Clyde and, and council members uh, for having me this morning. I've also got with me this morning um, board member Nick uh, Cabello uh, from our Nighthawk Board of Directors. So, uh, Nick, are, are you on the line as well? Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for having us, everybody. Awesome. So, uh, just the I guess the uh, the uh, point of today's uh, committee meeting and, and getting on the agenda here was uh, essentially to provide you guys with an update. I know that. Uh, Councillor Thiessen uh, does uh, sit on our board of directors, but I just wanted to, I guess, come from Nighthawk and present to you guys and, and uh, give you a verbal update as to where we are currently uh, and the, the things that we know and that we are doing our due diligence to, uh, to make sure that we've got accurate information for you guys uh, before we actually come uh, with an ask. So um, I guess I'll, I'll just start with, uh, obviously, uh, I'm sure as everybody is aware, uh, Nighthawk did experience a landslide um, in May 19th, on May 19th of 2020, uh, which I've previously presented to you uh, about, I think uh, I, I mentioned it back when we did our uh, capital uh, funding reallocation. Um, anyway, with that, I just, I'll just provide a, a brief update um, in terms of geotechnical. Um, so currently we're working with Parkland Geotechnical, a local uh, geotechnical engineering firm uh, to provide all of our, our I guess the the necessary uh, data collection and investigation into uh, I guess what our steps forward will be. So currently, uh, where we are with them, it, and sorry if my tablet here is updating, and I'm not sure if you guys can hear that, but <laughs> sorry if it's interrupting. Um, anyway, so where we're at with that is uh, currently uh, Parkland had just completed at the end of uh, October a uh, borehole drilling program. Uh, so essentially what they did was uh, drill uh, 10 boreholes on the hill, uh, a seven of them on our lift line in particular, and then another three on our uh, riverbank. Um, because uh, over the last three spring breakups, we've actually had some of our gabion walls actually wash away. So those, uh, for those that aren't familiar what a gabion wall is, essentially that rock um, mesh uh, that, that sits on the riverbank to hold the riverbank back when uh, when fast water's running by. She's um, popular guy this morning, sorry. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, so, so with that, uh, that borehole program has been completed, and uh, right now we're just waiting on the final uh, report, which is supposed to come back to us at the end of the month here, end of November, uh, that'll give us clear, a clear path forward in terms of what our, uh, our, our, I guess, our options are. And just to give you an update, some of those options that we're looking at um, include, uh, one, reinstalling the chairlift back where it is. Um, two, moving the chairlift, possibly to another area on the hill that might be more stable, um, if that's what comes back. Uh, three, um, would be not being able to install the chairlift at all and having to look at another lift option, which is one I want to talk to you about today, um, potentially, just to kind of put that in, in the bug in your ear uh, as we go into budget talk, uh, which would be a T-bar option. And then uh, four, obviously, worst case would be that we, we can't do anything and... Uh, we'll have to look at other options. So my hope is that that, isn't, is that, that is the very worst case. Um, and, and, that, and we haven't uh, had any indications from Parkland from the, from the investigation that they've done thus far, uh, indicating that that will be what they'll be suggesting. So um, I'm hopeful that that uh, doesn't come up. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, we don't have an accurate number at this point because we are still in that investigation stage. Um, I think one thing that I have learned is that engineering does move very slowly. Um, unfortunately, I mean, in, in data collection, I think it's important that all the, the right steps are taken. And as, I, as uh, I've said to many people, our board and, and management are, are focused on providing a long-term solution here, not just a Band-Aid fix. It's not something that we want to uh, just uh, uh, put some, push some earth back where it needs to be and, and then hope for the best. We want to make sure that we're making the right decisions here. Also in this process, uh, we've really uh, strengthened our relationship with Alberta Environment and Parks. Uh, we've been talking with them extensively, obviously, because we hold a land lease with uh, Alberta Environment and Parks, and, and uh, being that they own the land that we're on, um, 
they are invested and uh, interested in, in obviously maintaining that recreational lease that we have and, uh, and having that land used for recreational purposes. So uh, in doing so, we've actually uh, been able to, so far, get about $250,000 from the province of Alberta uh, to help out with the borehole drilling program, uh, which was, came in at a price of about $85,000. And then the boreholes along the riverbank was about another $16,000. Uh, so we've, we've gotten that coverage from them. We also uh, have uh, pitched a, uh, a, a proposal for the civil engineering side, uh, working with uh, local engineering firm Barstow um, Engineering. And uh, we've had a proposal from them uh, for the construction civil engineering uh, design side that comes in at roughly about 62500 That again, I've uh, been able to get covered by the province. Um, so that's, that's positive. And then Steve Bradbury from Alberta Environment Parks in, in uh, Edmonton has also uh, allocated $85,900 to help with construction costs in 2021. Um, again, typically, for what I've been hearing from the engineer, engineers, and I'm sure you guys have, have heard this from many engineers, is that usually design costs are about 10% of overall um, construction costs. Uh, I mean, Nighthawk is, is we are, are very good at uh, getting gifts in kind from the community. And again, the support, um, even when the landslide first happened, was, uh, was tremendous. I mean, we, I had people reaching out to me uh, in droves and, and unfortunately we were just weren't ready for, that, for the help yet. Um, but I did tell them, you know, please stand by. When we're ready, we definitely will, uh, would appreciate um, the offer, that the offers are still there. So um, certainly that's, uh, that's one thing that we, uh, we do well. And, and I think the community values uh, Nighthawk I mean, it's been, been a, a part of the community for 60 years. Actually, November 11th, tomorrow, is 60 years since uh, Nighthawk actually uh, came into existence here in the community. And um, I'm hopeful that it's here for another 60 years. So um, another part of this update I just wanted to provide because uh, insurance is another piece that we're working on as well. Um, so we're working through RMA, um, which is through the MD of Greenview. Uh, we're under the MD's pol policy. Uh, and with that, uh, we do have uh, some, uh, I guess, advances happening there. Uh, essentially, what, what our insurers are telling us is we have coverage for repair or damage, uh, repair or replacement of damaged infrastructure. Uh, again, um, because we had mitigated some of the risk and damage to the chairlift, uh, there wasn't a lot of damage done to the chairlift. It was essentially just moved, the towers moved downhill. Um, so they haven't given me, given me a clear number yet as to what that looks like in terms of coverage. But some of the things that are included in our, in our insurance policy uh, will be the repair to the damaged infrastructure for snowmaking that was, was damaged, the repair and or replacement of the uh, uh, lighting that was the brand new LED lighting that went in last fall um, that ended up being damaged by the slide. Uh, that'll be repa uh, replaced. Um, and then, of course, any professional services uh, that are incurred, fees that are incurred uh, during this process, and uh, also. Uh, after, I'm, I'm, it's going to be an in-depth investigation, I'm sure, into in terms of uh, revenue uh, losses as well. Um, so we do have business interruption insurance as well. So um, that should should help a, bit, a little bit there. Um, I guess uh, one of the things in terms of what we have in terms of actual accurate numbers right now um, from uh, uh, Doppelmeyer, uh, a list provider, um, we have sourced out the T-bar the option, which I did mention. Um, and that comes in at roughly about $1.5 million. Um, that's for uh, manufacturing, install, and then certification. Um, that process takes roughly about six to eight months um, from time of order. Uh, so for us to move forward with this, um, I guess as per, uh, per the ask on, on this, uh, on my, um, I guess, delegation request form, uh, you know, in terms of the cost that we actually know right now, the 1.5 is a, is a hard, hard number. Uh, you know, we've been given that quote from Doppelmeyer and, and that, um, however, again, I, I don't want to have that as our top end number here that I'm putting to council because I don't know what, what the rest of it's going to look like until we get that final geotechnical report back. So I do want to put that to council that, um, you know, this is, this is the first ask, I guess, but I would, I would hope that, um, you know, we, we are able to, I know that uh, the city does uh, allocate so much to emergency funding annually, um, but I also uh, want to make sure that uh, you know you guys can do what you need to do as you go into budget talks here 
uh, this week. Um, I think it's going to be important that we do need our municipal players to, to be uh, part of this, uh, not only the discussion, but also part of the, the solution. Um, because we, I, I, I do think that Nighthawk offers a lot to our region and, and to our community. And that's not just because I work there. So, um, you know, I've been using the Hill since I was nine years old and uh, when my family moved here in 88. And uh, I really think that, you know, the, with the number of students and everything that we put through the Hill, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a valuable part of our community. Um, and I'll, I'll let Nick talk to that more afterwards, just as, as a board member. But um, the other part of my, uh, I guess, the, the, the delegation request this morning was back uh, a few months ago, we had come to all three councils uh, with our three municipal partners and asked for a reallocation of funding, of capital funding for operating use. Um, should it be needed. Um, that, uh, that total number was $175,000. Um, we've since, uh, and, and this is, you know, thanks to uh, federal programming like the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy and, and uh, other things like that, um, we've been able to cash flow things and, and I'm very proud of my team. We've actually, uh, you know, as much as we, we aren't making as much revenue, we're actually more profitable overall uh, right now. Uh, that's, uh, you know, and again, I, I we're, we're not offering the same services by any means. Um, you know, with our restaurant closed, our summer slide was closed this summer, our bike park was closed this summer. Um, so of course we didn't have the staffing expenses to go with that, that comes with providing services. Um, but uh, we have been able to, to maintain a, a positive uh, position up until this point. So as of right now, we're sitting on just under $104,000 of that uh, 175,000 uh, uh, capital reallocation. Um, so my ask to, to, I guess, maybe to take forward the council or administration is that uh, of that, so $63,000 was asked from city uh, council to be reallocated um, to make up that 175. We've since spent 25,608.50 and uh, currently have left 37,391.50. Uh, so of the of the city of GP portion of the ask. Of the MD of Greenview, we still have 40,507.46. Uh, and of the County of Grand Prairie, we have 25,966.32. So um, we, like I said, the, just shy of 104. This year's projection, based on what myself and our bookkeeper, uh, Kalina, have gone through in terms of our cash flow projections, we've done the same thing that we presented back when we did the $175,000 ask, uh, was basically a best case, worst case, and most likely. Um, right now, uh, and this is not taking into account, obviously, just the, the, the new information about the wage subsidy being extended into the new year for January. We've only gone up to December 31st, as it was previously announced. Um, but our season is looking at about $118,000 uh, deficit. So of that, uh, this 104 would be very nice to have as, again, a continued buffer in case we can't um, do what we've been doing all, sum all, all summer and all fall and keeping that positive, uh, positive position. So uh, I guess my ask is just again, that we, we get an extension on that. I know typically end of year funds uh, that are unused are returned, but I would ask that we can keep that. So we're not coming with another ask. I know that uh, all three councils really appreciated the fact that we weren't asking for more money at the time um, and that we were just asking for reallocation. So I'd like to continue that, uh, that same trend and just keep this as a, as a, as a safety net essentially uh, for, for us as we go into the new year. So um, that's it for what I have to, uh, I guess, uh, verbally present to you guys this morning. And again, thank you so much for uh, making the time and uh, that I know this is a busy week for you with budget uh, coming up and, and, and the like, and also all the uh, uh, Remembrance Day and, and, and that. So uh, thank you. And also maybe I'll, I'll just turn it over to Nick uh, Cabello, our, our uh, vice president from our board, uh, if he has anything to add. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I did want to just add a couple things, and and this is more. I think Jonathan touched on it, but I really wanted to kind of drive the point home. Um, we put through on an average year between seven and ten thousand uh, school students uh, from the Grand Prairie community. Um, we do race events, which the bulk of those uh, people that are participating which is 12 to, to upwards of 1,500 people a year are, are from Grand Prairie. Um, I think we do a huge amount for the community uh, when it comes to teaching people how to learn how to ski. Uh, we're actually doing uh, skateboarding classes for people. So Jonathan and his team have really tried to diversify. If you look at Bear Paw, that's a prime example where we're, we're partnering with the city to try and 
make something of uh, uh, basically a program that was completely closed three or four years ago, right? And, and not used at all. So 70% um, of our usership is from the city. Everybody, I just wanted to kind of make sure everybody's aware of that. We really wanted to make sure that we come to you with an appropriate ask when the time comes. And that's why the, uh, the board of directors and Jonathan and his team have all agreed basically, hey, you know, we don't have this geotechnical report completed. We want to give the councils uh, an idea of, of where we're at, uh, you know, and, 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 and make sure that those numbers are real. I mean, the one number uh, Jonathan presented uh, for the T-bar, that's a real hard number that we have now, but that's only one of the options that we have on the table. We're, Jonathan is, and his team have done a real, I think, service to the community in general and, and in Nighthawk and really making sure that we dig deep and uh, make sure we have the correct numbers uh, to present to you guys when they happen. And unfortunately, we tried to get the geotechnical done earlier, uh, but uh, we did not have that opportunity. To, it won't be done until November, the end of November. So I'm hoping uh, we're able to come back and talk to you guys more and kind of work through uh, hopefully, you know, something that'll make this hill uh, get back to where it was. And I think with Jonathan at the helm and the management team he has in place, I think we can be extremely successful uh, in really uh, mitigating our asks in the future from council, but there's gonna be a big one. We all know that we had a, you know, a major landslide event there, as Jonathan said, we all are aware of it. And we really need to get back to uh, where we you know, were two years ago. Uh, well, last year at the end of the season. So. Um, Thank you guys for the time. I'm hoping you recognize how big of a part of the community uh, Nighthawk is. And, you know, and, and I mean, I moved here in 2015 and, and it was one of the considerations of me moving uh, to Grand Prairie and having access to those types of facilities for my kids. It's extremely important to me. I'm, I'm a board member. I don't get paid uh, to, to sit here and talk to you. I'm just really passionate about, uh, you know, having recreational facilities that everybody can use that are varied and in a time like this where, where we're seeing uh, you know, indoor facilities having major challenges with COVID, an outdoor facility, although it still has some of those challenges is, is, is present an, an alternative for people in the community. So um, thank you very much for the time guys. I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, continue to partner and, uh, in, in, and get Nighthawk, Night, Nighthawk back to where it needs to be. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks, I appreciate, yes. appreciate I guess, your. If there's any, oh. Sorry, go ahead. If there's any, any, if there's any questions at all from from council, uh, I, I can certainly uh, do my best to to answer any. Absolutely. Um, I have uh, uh, Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Chair Blackburn. Uh, thanks for coming today, gentlemen. A couple questions in regards to. Um, the hill as it is today. Um, I know I saw on social media that you're currently making snow and I think that's great, but um, can you tell us uh, where you're at in regards to um, opening dates? I think I know what it is, but just for public consumption, if you wanna elaborate on that. And as well, um, what does operationally the hill look like for this upcoming winter season? For sure, so uh, with, with this season and, and you're right there, uh, Jackie, we, we did already uh, um, start making snow. We started that on Friday evening this, this past weekend, um, and the guys uh, made some great progress. Unfortunately, yesterday we had to shut down uh, just uh, up until, I think we're gonna be starting up again this evening. Um, and with the, the terrain that we've got open for this coming season, uh, we've got about another seven to eight days of snowmaking left. Uh, so it's definitely a smaller, a shorter uh, snowmaking season for us. Uh, normally we'd be anywhere of 21 to 24 days straight of snowmaking. Uh, to get the whole hill open. So this year for uh, for the operation, uh, what that'll look like is uh, we have uh, done a few things actually uh, to expand skiable terrain that we have. So doing what we can with what we have to work with this year. Um, so top of show off run for those that are, that are familiar, uh, we've created a cut across, uh, that, uh, a new cat track cut across that comes across the bottom of our half pipe run and back out onto the platter lift. Uh, being that the potter lift is going to be our main lifting source this year. Um, and uh, we do have also the 600 foot conveyor as well as the bump conveyor. Um, we've also uh, 
uh, working with Alberta Environment and Parks and, and uh, getting a TFA, uh, we're able to um, expand the skiable terrain on Willow Way. So we actually expanded that by about 40 feet. Uh, so about 33% more skiable terrain on Willow Way. Uh, so that's uh, going to, uh, again, provide more, more space. Uh, we've, we're also going to be working with uh, Wade Coates. He's a, a terrain park designer out of COP. Uh, we've worked with him in the past, and he's just an amazing uh, CAD operator and, and, and visionary when it comes to park building. Uh, so we'll be working with him and having him come up uh, to build our park original, uh, initially in this season and then also throughout the season to keep it new and fresh and, and interesting for the kids. Uh, and families is to come come back uh, just after Christmas and then again uh, mid-February to do an, an end of season uh, uh, change up so that uh, the, we keep that going right to, to the end of March. Um, opening day uh, at this point is, is currently scheduled for uh, Saturday, November 21st. Uh, so that's not this weekend, but the following weekend we'll be doing a soft film day. Some new changes obviously with regards to COVID-19 and obviously the, the fact that we do have less terrain and we don't want to uh, be providing a, a bad experience for our guests. Um, our, uh, our capacity per day uh, now is going to be cut down to about 150 um, on the main ski hill and then we're between 80 and 100 in the tube zone. And again, that's to, to work within physical distance, distancing uh, guidelines, but also so that we don't end up with a lineup of 300 people at the bottom of the platter list that are then waiting for 30 minutes to get up the hill um, after they've skied down for a minute and a half. So. Um, we, we definitely don't want uh, that type of an experience. Uh, so we are doing that. We are moving to online ticket sales as well, um, as most ski areas are uh, across the province. Um, so we'll be, uh, this year we made the choice not to sell season passes. We're actually gonna be uh, launching here a uh, multi-visit um, coupon voucher essentially, which will have a coupon code at the top. So you can get either 12 visits for the price of 10, uh, or six for the price of five, and use that coupon code when you're booking online to then uh, uh, basically take that amount off your off your balance owing. Um, so that'd be great for families and that. Um, typically a season pass, you'd have to come out to the hill uh, about 13 times to um, uh, pay off your season pass. So this is a, a great other option. Um, also, we have had to make adjustments to things like our lift ticket rates, obviously with uh, less skiable terrain. Um, we're bringing us our rates more in line with places like Snow Valley and East Link Park and White Court. Uh, again, just, uh, just to be more in line with what we're offering. Um, other things, all our indoor spaces this year, we'll see, uh, see face coverings being mandatory just as they are in the city uh, with the bylaw right now. All ski areas are taking that stance. Just again, we don't wanna be the reason we lose our season. Um, and uh, that, that's coming forward. Uh, so we'll, we'll be, uh, obviously our indoor spaces are limited in terms of capacity as well. So the lounge this year will just be, end up, it will actually end up being uh, cafeteria overflow uh, seating. Uh, so we, in our cafeteria, Jackie, you know it well, we spent a lot of time in the chalet, um, but we uh, normally can fit about anywhere between 80 and 90 people in that cafeteria this season because of uh, physical distancing guidelines from AHS and working with our health inspector, we can fit about 36. So um, it's considerably cutting down our capacity there. So um, this year, again, ski areas are using the, taking the stance that use your vehicle as your base camp, as your home base. Um, we won't have indoor areas to change. Um, it's come, and, come, come ready to, to play, just like you do at Eastlink. Um, you come ready to swim, ready to work out. Uh, there's uh, the change rooms aren't being used there. Our rental shop, uh, we've got uh, barriers in place for our rental techs and our ticket office staff uh, or, or our, our rental service staff um, and also in our cafeterias and our, in our tube zone. Um, this season though, we are excited actually in the Aquaterra tube zone to be adding a new product uh, called glow tubing. So we actually have, um, we ordered some black lights and got those up in the, the tube zone at a, at a really great, co a great, great cost and, and to add something new to talk about this season. <laughs> Better looking every day, thanks Chris. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, so we've got that and uh, we've added some speakers over there for music. So again, to change the experience and, and we'll be renting some laser lights from uh, Long McQuaid. Uh, again, just to create a cool new experience. Uh, we, we got that idea. There's some, uh, some series out of the States actually that do it. And, and also uh, I think Chicopee Tubes Park in uh, uh, Ontario does it and, and they get a lot of great interest from it. So uh, some of the feedback we've got on that already, people are pumped and stoked for those types of things. and. I think the other thing I just saw in the Edmonton Journal just the other day um, that, that uh, Snow Valley and uh, Edmonton Ski Club, the uh, Rabbit Hill and also uh, Sunridge are, are all seeing uh, 
great uh, sales on all the products that they're having um, and uh, and that. So I'm I'm hopeful that uh, you know people are going to be looking for safe, fun, outdoor things to do this winter, and that uh, Nighthawk can can continue to provide that even though it will be in a reduced capacity. Uh, you know I I think that uh, you know it, it should be a great season and and for our partner groups, our Alpine Ski Team, our Freestyle Team, and also our Snowboard Club, uh, we are working with them. We actually. Uh, so that they're not competing for for uh, for space on the hill, we're actually working with them on a special uh, training pass that covers our expenses for the nights that we're going to be operating for them. So Tuesdays and Thursdays from 6 p.m. to 8:30 p.m., just the clubs only will be on the hill, which will be the first time ever we've done that, and that'll provide them uh, access to the facilities that they need without uh, competing with the public for it. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited for that. It's again the first time we've done it. Um, and uh, and they're they're being really uh, great to work with uh, and and adapting here as as we're all adapting this year. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Jonathan. Thank you, just Jonathan. just uh, one <laughs> comment. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, appreciate your passion and the information. I think that uh, you updated uh, council and those of us watching with some great information. Um, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the thoughtful process that your organization has gone through to prepare um, for the upcoming season. I wish you the best of luck with your last year's snowmaking days. And uh, um, I think that your facility is, is, is an asset to our region. Um, and I just, I'm very happy to see that you're so prepared while in addition trying to add on some new, um, uh, a new product for the community to enjoy. So thanks for your hard work. Thank you, Jackie. Great. Thanks for coming in and thanks for being adaptive for our community. Um, so I've been on I've been on the tube zone a few times. I've been on the water slide a number of times, but I'm not a skier or snowboarder, so I've never skied or snowboarded on Nighthawk, although I really appreciate how important it is for our residents who do and for professional attraction to our region too, so I really get the importance of it. But since I've never used it myself, I'm still kind of at a loss to understand the impact of the slide on you folks. So can you just give me a rough percentage of about how much of your skiing area are you down this are you down this season? And is it your best terrain? Is it average terrain? Just for somebody that's never skier snowboarded at Nighthawk, can you just give me a better idea of what this year looks like versus last year? For sure. So, so roughly, we're going to be down. I, I'm going to say it's going to it's more than 50% of our skiable terrain uh, that we will be down this season. And I do have to say though, Dylan, we need to get you out for a lesson uh, so that we can get you skiing or snowboarding. Uh, this and you and you can't say you're too old because nobody's too old to learn. We've got Bob Newfeld who's 92 and he still comes up to ski. So anyway, Bob's my um, neighbor, so deal. Oh, <laughs> perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, so uh, we do have a. a, a considerable decrease in uh, amount of skiable terrain. And, and unfortunately, again, when we redid our budget uh, after post landslide and actually cut a million dollars from our operating budget this year, um, that was because we felt that we would see at least a 30% decline in our ridership because of the terrain that we were losing. Uh, because un unfortunately, it is our intermediate and advanced terrain um, that uh, you know a lot of people enjoyed. Uh, Temptation, I know you're not familiar, but it's one of my favorite runs, and that's where the land fight actually happened. Um, uh, that took out two of, two of our lift towers. It actually moved towers three and four down the hill about 100 feet and over to the west about uh, 40 to 50 feet. And each one of those towers has a 30,000-pound has a concrete base under it. Um, so you can imagine the forces that were in play there to, to move those. And if you saw the pictures, all the towers were still standing upright. And that's because they're bottom heavy, obviously. The towers uh, themselves weigh about 4,600 pounds. Um, so they, they move down, downhill. Um, so uh, also, uh, I guess that we've got, I'm going to say, there's about four runs there, four or five runs that are actually affected, but it's about, about 50 to 55% of our skiable terrain. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Any other questions for the delegation? Mr. Clarkson, I'm going to ask, I did not write down the information that you were giving us right at the very beginning of your presentation. Can you tell me the uh, dollar amount again for the, uh, the uh, ask? I, I, I got the information about the reallocation of capital funds, but what was the first request in the dollar amount? For sure. So right now, uh, uh, Clyde, we've, we've got... Uh, Approximately the, the hard number that we have right now in place for the T-bar, if we have to go that option, is 1.5 million. 
Um, but again, that doesn't include any hill remediation costs. And uh, as, as I mentioned with our insurance coverage, we do have, so the insurance coverage is for repair or replacement of damaged infrastructure. It does not cover any remediation. Um, of course, if there was any land work that was needed to put the towers where, back where they were, that would be covered. But anything outside of that to resurface the run, reshape the run, uh, do any uh, water, uh, water uh, management on, on the run, uh, or on the hill anywhere is not covered by our insurance. So um, it, this is where in my talks with Alberta Environment Park, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, to work through some of that and, and I'm hopeful that maybe we can possibly that some more capital stimulus funding we can access through them. But again, those are no guarantees. In, in my talks with Steve Bradbury from AEP, there's no guarantees with that. But 1.5 million at this point is the hard number that I have for a new T-bar. Um, but again, we all know how Earthwork uh, goes and uh, that is not always a cheap thing so I know you you uh, you are dealing with this I think Bear Creek I think there's some some uh, things happening on the Bear Creek culture here by 68th Avenue on uh, re uh, in, in terms of uh, restabilizing an area that's sliding into the creek and those types of things so I know uh, council is more than aware and administration is uh, of the, the costs that are associated with that so uh, 1.5 million is, is, is the hard fast number we know now. And I hope to come back to you uh, once we have that geotechnical report uh, to really give more insight into, in terms of what we now know uh, as, uh, as, as to our path forward. So. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Clayton. Thanks, uh, Jonathan, in regards to the uh, request of extending the unused reallocated capital funding um, uh, with the reduced attendance due to restrictions from COVID um, of people and um, the, pro the proposed uh, per user rate being reduced based on what you're offering. Um, is Tell me, you know, so you're obviously gonna have overall less revenue, yes. but you're also offering less service. So tell me um, how would the impact, what would the impact look like if, uh, today you weren't approved uh, in regards to having the money transferred to, to the upcoming season? Um, well, obviously, uh, you know, and this is again, uh, most likely scenario. And, and, and I guess even my, my projection at thir a 30% redu reduction in ridership, um, that might be on the low end. I, I don't know, you know, experience in talking with, uh, we, I was actually on a bunch, uh, a bunch of web calls with uh, the skiers in, in Australia and New Zealand, because obviously they've already gone through their winter season. And, and many of them were saying that they saw increases. But for us, obviously with the, uh, as you know, Jackie, on a Saturday or Sunday, we sometimes would see upwards of 600 people on the hill. So now to set our capacity at a hard number of 150 uh, because of less skiable terrain, um, it, could, it could be more impactful. Um, but uh, that being said, as I mentioned, with regards to our, our projections at this point, uh, our, our most likely is at $118,000 loss. Um, so not having that extension of, of the reallocated capital funding uh, that was put towards operating of the, the 103 would, would mean that we'd be taking on that $118,000 loss this season. Um, and, and I think I've mentioned it to numerous people that I've talked to in the community um, and, some, and some council members that I don't feel that um, you know Nighthawk. If we were, if we had to go through this a second season, um, and that I, I don't know in terms of weathering the storm, it might be. A, I, I see it as being a tough thing um, because to to go through this. Uh, so I, I really feel that you know, as of Feb in February, we have to have a decision to move forward. Whatever that looks like, we need to make that decision and, and have the support from the municipalities and and all the partners and players that are that are, that are there um, because. Uh, Again, to, to weather this storm twice, uh, I mean, we got knocked down with COVID and then uh, punched in the gut with, uh, with a landslide. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that uh, we, we wanna go through this at all another, another season. Um, we, can, we can do our best like as we have all summer to, to keep in a positive position um, and, and uh, keep the cash flow uh, on that positive side and keeping all our, our vendors paid. So Jonathan, I um, you know, I. So I think council will probably, assuming uh, the discussion for um, of the 25% uh, ski hill re remediation will go to budget, assuming that happens with a motion today. The one, the, the, the bucket that I want to talk about most primarily is, is the request for reallocation. Um, 
uh, as you mentioned, the city's contribution would be approximately 40 of the 104,000, and in your most likely scenario, you're at approximately $113,000 loss. So there's still a shortfall there. Uh, tell me what the Ski Hills plan is for that. Are you going to be coming back to us at the end of the season and say, so we need still actually need another 20 because your 25% of our loss was more substantial? Um, what does that look like at the end of the season? Or is there does the organization have a plan for any additional shortcomings? Uh, well, we have uh, some of the other things that we have taken advantage of in terms of uh, in terms of programming and that from the federal government is we did apply for the SIBA loan. Uh, so we, our board did make the decision that we are going to use that $40,000 uh, to put towards snowmaking expenses for this year, um, again, to, to pick up some of that shortfall. Um, again, uh, as I mentioned, we, we didn't take into account the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy anywhere past December 31st, because at the time when we were building our scenarios, we didn't know anything uh, that wasn't in place at that time. So now, uh, now that that is there, I mean, that is going to provide a bit of, more of a buffer. Um, but uh, you're you're very right there. I mean, we may we could come back and ask for uh, ask for more, or, or again, a reallocation of our of some of our capital asks for 2021 that's in in to budget and that was approved. Um, we may ask for a reallocation of that. I I, I really. I, I don't want to come back asking for more money, um, but uh, and and that. But uh, I, I really think that uh, if we can, um, with what the the programming that is available, I, I think that's going to provide a little bit more of a buffer for us. Uh, so so that hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Eric. Somebody had a comment. Uh, thank you, Chair Blackburn. I'm uh, just rereading the motion from uh, May 4th, where uh, Council um, uh, approved the transfer of 63000 from capital to operating. Um, in, the, in the precise motion, there wasn't any uh, deadline uh, associated with that. So we, we could go back and re review the, uh, the meeting, but uh, as far as administration is concerned, uh, once that was moved from capital to operating, that uh, we would take no further action on, on that, that it had, uh, was within uh, Nighthawk's board's hands. So seeing that, um, I'm thinking the director is implying that we don't need a motion per se on that. Uh, Chair Blackburn, uh, not per se. If uh, council wish to uh, to reconfirm their support for this, that uh, that would. Uh, but as far as any actions required, um, we we wouldn't be taking any um, based on a timeline. Sure. So uh, if there's no further questions, uh, Chair Blackburn, I'd be prepared to make a motion uh, to extend the unused reallocated capital funding. Um, uh, from earlier in 2020 to help with any operational shortfalls in the upcoming 2020-21 winter season. So as noted there, um, I, I'm pretty sure uh, administration has that document. And speaking to that, um, I do appreciate the fact that, um, in my opinion, uh, I always appreciate when people can be forthcoming with any surplus. I think that to spend money because you simply have it is is not the path that we like people to go down. So I do appreciate that you know they have been uh, fiscally responsible with their money. They're going through an immense amount of change and an immense amount of stress. They are still offer, uh, having an opportunity to offer to our region a, um, an outdoor recreation facility and an experience that will be enjoyed by many, albeit uh, reduced capacity and reduced amount of um, product that they are offering. I still think that they have been very creative and worked very hard to get to what where they're going to be th for this season. And I encourage committee to support uh, um, this uh, motion and allow them the opportunity to have a successful winter season ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I believe that motion is in order. Now, is, <coughs> is this, a, I just need to check, is this a motion that we as a, a committee can approve or do we have to refer it to council? In my opinion, as the director already stated, that it's not really necessary. I think committee would be an appropriate um, direction just to reaffirm uh, the motion from May and, and so that the, that the organization knows where they stand and that they can go ahead with that. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion or debate on Councillor Clayton's motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote, please. And so that passes unanimously. Thank you, Councillor Clayton, for that. Um, now, regarding uh, regarding a request for capital f 
funds. Um, I, I would entertain a motion regarding uh, perhaps moving that uh, uh, to council budget deliberations. Councillor Pallad. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. There we go. The red light wasn't on. So there we go. Um, I would just make a motion, but I would look to administration to make sure this is it, this will work at budget because um, we do have a fairly tight two-day schedule. But I would like to refer this to budget, but I just want to make sure that that's uh, doable with the budget packages already being sent out. Director Lebert. Uh, thank you, Chair Blackburn. Uh, yes, referring this to budget to, uh, will ensure that the, there is a discussion uh, this uh, this Friday. So, so with that, thank you, Director Bork, for that. So with that, I would make a motion that we refer this, uh, the capital item to budget, please. Thank you. Uh, any discussion or debate on Councillor Palat's motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for the vote. Please vote. And so that passes unanimously as well. So uh, thank you to Mr. Clarkson and uh, um, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. We uh, appreciate the amount of uh, contribution that Nighthawk makes to the community and for your ongoing efforts to, um, um, to, to be of value to the community. So uh, we wish you well. Uh, for your season, and uh, I guess you'll want to stay tuned at budget time. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask at this point that uh, you s s sort of step away from the table by turning off your microphone and camera, and if you'd like to continue watching, you're welcome to. Th thank, thank, thank you, you so much, time. Council. I appreciate the opportunity to come in and, and uh, present and, and let you know where we are currently, and... Uh, Look forward to coming back to you with more information once we learn from the geotech engineering firm that we're working with uh, as to our next steps forward. So thank you again and stay safe and healthy, everyone. Bye. Thanks very much. All right, um, Director Miller, thank you for your patience. Uh, I guess you're up next. All right, uh, thank you, Chair Blackburn. So I'll just start off with the Community Knowledge Campus. So for the, and Twin Ice Arenas, for the month of October, we had 49% of the ice time was booked. And for East Link Center utilization, during the last two weeks of October, the aquatics rentals averaged 67% of time slots were booked and fitness classes were uh, about 48%. And just a heads up that the CKC campus will be closed for the remaining staff holidays in uh, 2020. So uh, Remembrance Day, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, and also New Year's Day in 2021 will be closed. Uh, for events and entertainment for Revolution Place, I think everybody's aware we had the host of the PBR event, the professional bull riding event over the weekend. It was very successful. We uh, received lots of thanks and kudos from, uh, from the participants as well as uh, the company that organized it. And we were also told that uh, we, we sort of came to the rescue and uh, the event was supposed to be held in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, but uh, they canceled. So we had the honor of uh, hosting the, the finals for PBRA. So it was uh, good on our crew as well to step up and do that to, uh, to make it uh, happen. So it, uh, just a few quick stats, the PBR tour brought 79 crew and athletes to the city. It was 38 athletes, uh, 27 of those were professional bull riders and then 11 junior bull riders. We also had seven different stock contractors and 22 PBR crew members and 12 TSN crew members that were uh, got to enjoy our city. So it was four events that we hosted. It was a PBR Shell Rotella Challenge, the PBR Wrangler Shootout, PBR Cooper's Tires Classic, and the PBR Built Ford Tough Canadian Championship. So all four events were on closed TV sets for TSN, and they will be broadcasted over the next four Tuesdays starting at 7.30 p.m. So uh, fans will still be able to watch it on uh, Ride Pass ca as well and uh, and then our city of course is highlighted in the, the television uh, segments and then we also had the pleasure of having uh, premier kenny participate in the canadian final event on saturday so the premier presented the 2020 canadian championship belt buckle to our champion uh, dakota butar and then uh, switching to facilities uh, some good news our new ultra low charge ice plant is up and running at the curling club 
So they're in the process of making ice and then uh, for their scheduled opening of November 16th. And uh, with Fleet, we um, previously council agreed that we could uh, donate two buses to the airport. It's for on-site emergency response. So those will be delivered this week. And also uh, the RFP for two new 35 foot buses will be uh, uh, put on the website soon. And those are two thirds funded by uh, Green Trip funding and then one third by uh, the city. And then switching to sports development, wellness and culture, the RFP for our, our activity reception center was released yesterday, November 9th. And the opportunity will close on December 2nd with the expected award date of uh, in late December. We've also begun work on the rezoning application and, uh, and looking at the required permits. The geotech drilling was completed on October 30th and we should have the results in the next couple of weeks. Early indications are that uh, the soil is suitable for whatever we decide to build. And then with transit, uh, ridership on accessible is at about 25% of what we normally would have and con conventional is sitting at about 50%. So relatively unchanged. And we will have transit service tomorrow on Remembrance Day as we have done in the past. And then for later this week on uh, Vegas night, which is Friday, November 13th, we'll uh, be providing uh, later service. And so the last buses will leave the downtown at 11.15 p.m. So that's my uh, update, Chair Blackburn, if there's any questions. Thank you, Director Miller. Are there any questions on the report? Uh, Councillor Bressy. Great. Thank you. I've just been getting a few questions from members of the public about East Link Centre and the impact of the restrictions that came down last week. So could you just give me a little bit more about if that's if we need to be more restrictive or take less booking rentals or just how does how do the restrictions that came out last week impact the Eastlake Centre? Uh, thanks Chair Blackburn. Um, so we did have to uh, reduce the size of uh, the, the groups inside the centre. I think uh, as an example the aquatics uh, users I think they were previously they were in groups of 20 now they're restricted to 15. So we're trying to segment uh, the centre out so that we could we can still maximize the use and in a safe manner. Uh, for our meeting rooms, of course, we uh, were now limited to 15 indoors as well. So the impact wasn't uh, significant. It was just some uh, tweaking and uh, we're still doing the best we can to serve the community as, as much as possible. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions for the director? Um, thank you very much. Uh, Director Miller, and we'll move on to the next item 1.2, 2020 Community Improvement Grants. And I believe we'll be hearing from Tricia Millward. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to be here today to uh, talk to you about the, um, the first round of um, grants uh, for the Community Improvement uh, Grant, which was formally the Parks Improvement Grant, the um, Community Enhancement Grant, and the Neighborhood Improvement Matching Grant. So um, from, uh, from a user uh, perspective, um, certainly it was a much more user friendly to have one grant that they could go to. And as well from an administrative uh, standpoint, um, it was much more efficient and um, to be able to work through one grant versus the three. Um, we had eight grant applications this year and um, Three of them uh, were local organizations and five of them were from um, uh, neighborhood associations. So we are here uh, today to uh, request that committee uh, recommend to council to approve uh, $20,110.25 to the community um, improvement grant. Um, the grants all, they range from, um, from the, uh, addressing graffiti and food sensitivities. Uh, they all had uh, great uh, community engagement components. Uh, community Village, a, um, they've been uh, experiencing some uh, graffiti and so we know from past experiences uh, funding murals that uh, that significantly reduces uh, graffiti in the area. And also being in the, the city center, uh, it'll be uh, appreciated by all those who visit there. O'Brien Lake, uh, we're really happy to, um, to see O'Brien Lake um, uh, flourishing again. They were inactive for about three years and they actually um, uh, won the neighborhood uh, 
uh, scavenger hunt for Neighbor Day and had a, a treat of a, a great picnic. So um, they are um, moving forward with an application to have an orchard again, another great community building um, uh, project that they're working with the Parks Department. Uh, the Canadian Motorcycle Tourism um, Association, uh, they are applying again in partnership and we always love to see partnerships because uh, it's great to have collaboration. Um, so they are in partnership with the Hillside Neighborhood Association again for this year. And um, they're looking at addressing food insecurities um, for their, um, uh, for their uh, Memorial uh, Gardens Interpretive Center. And also Pickleball, uh, their beautiful courts. Um, they have submitted a request for um, uh, um, a driveway, uh, driveway, sidewalks that will go from the parking area to the, um, the courts, uh, which will greatly uh, reduce uh, debris, grass, mud from entering into their uh, beautiful new facility. Um, Highland Park, so we had a number of uh, community um, improvements for our, their neighborhood green spaces. So Highland Park is great. There's uh, these very large um, uh, concrete slabs that have deteriorated over the years. And um, so they're going to repurpose them um, and paint and get uh, the big like chess pieces. So, and Parks is thrilled with that because it is in an area that's actually very underutilized in Lions Park. So um, VLA and Montrose, they're looking at um, adding some great benches as an older neighborhood. They, um, uh, they don't have all the, the um, furniture that a newer neighborhood might. And so they'll be looking at working with parks and putting in um, three benches into that area. And um, Swan Avon, I think I went past the, the hillside. So, sorry, Katie. Um, so Hillside last year, um, they also uh, submitted a grant for, um, for developing that community hub in the hillside area. So again, with the same theme of the uh, uh, food insecurities, uh, they are also looking at purchasing um, like a garden shed and equipment um, to, to help with that area. And with uh, Swan Avon, so Swan Avon, uh, they, if you haven't been to Wrights Grove lately, last year they put in a beautiful um, wooden swing. This year they're looking at providing the concrete slab. Um, Parks again is very thrilled with this because it just makes for much uh, greater maintenance in the area uh, for mowing and weeding. And then they're also uh, refurbishing. They got approval from um, ATCO and from um, the city to uh, wrap uh, a very rusted old um, utility box in, the neighbor in that same area. So um, we are recommending that funding as well to go forward. And so, you know, we're very thrilled with the applications. They all exemplify the purpose of the grants, which is to, to provide community building and pride in their neighborhoods. Um, so again, we are asking that uh, committee recommend to council uh, to fund the $20,110.25 for these grants. Thank you. I see we have a request from Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Chair Blackburn. Uh, thank you, Ms. Millward. Can you tell me, was there any applications that weren't approved? And, um, and I have a follow-up question to that. Uh, yes, thank you, through the Chair. Um, there were no applications that were not funded. Um, uh, all the uh, eight applications um, uh, were funded, not in the, um, there was only one that wasn't funded in the full amount, but we still uh, made a recommendation to partially fund it. Great. And also, can you tell me, um, compared to prior years, are there um, how many of these are repeat neighborhoods that continue to be, um, you know, proactive in doing great things in their uh, community, and how many are new ones? Uh, thank you, through the chair. So um, O'Brien would be a new one. Uh, they have not been active. Um, they they had ap applied many years ago. Um, they were one of the first associations. Um, so it's great to see them uh, applying again. Uh, for VLA and Montrose, they are a, new, a newer uh, association. And so uh, this is their first application. Um, uh, Swanhaven, Highland Park, uh, they have 
been very active over the last few years and doing lots of great things uh, in their neighborhoods, um, Hillside as well. Um, and it, you know, it's great community village uh, being having the opportunity for the, the pickleball club as well um, to, to fund these. So to have this open up to, um, to all uh, nonprofits. Um, and I think that you know, we'll continue to see more. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Are there uh, any other questions for Ms. Millward? Um, Councillor Thiessen. Thank Thiessen. you very much, Chair Blackburn. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair Blackburn, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Millward. Uh, just a couple questions. So the, the total budget was $25,000. So of the recommendation, uh, if my math is correct, uh, please forgive me if it's not, but it's uh, roughly close to 4000 if all is approved as is that would go back into general revenue or would it be able to be used again before the end of the year? Um, I don't have the answer to that. I know that um, in the past, I don't know if it's carried forward or if it goes back into general revenue. Um, this is the only round of, of uh, grant applications that we will see. Katie will be able to provide that better. Go ahead, Ms. Bieberdorf. Thank you, Chair Blackburn. So if we do not spend the 25000 it just goes back into the pot of money. It won't carry forward to next year or anything like that. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Bieberdorf and Ms. Millward. Uh, so I guess my question is, um, since, uh, since there was no applications that weren't approved um, and this all came in under budget, um, what was the reasoning behind uh, the 1700 that uh, was is being recommended off of the 5000 that was requested from the pickleball club? Uh, yes, um, thank you. Through the chair, um, the uh, application that was sent in by the pickleball club, their budget actually was just over $10,000 for um, many items um, ranging from furniture to awnings. However, um, there were no quotes associated with those numbers. So we approached the, um, uh, the applicant and asked for further clarification on their budget numbers. And we received uh, a quotation back for, um, for the, the sidewalk from a concrete company to do the gravel in the sidewalk, which is that amount. Um, and then they also provided a ledger of, um, because it's a matching, they applied for the matching component. So they have um, provided a ledger of their members who have contributed donations to be used for these types of projects. So we matched, we were able to see that the match was there to, to fund the, the invoice, uh, the quote uh, that was provided with the application. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, I would be willing to entertain a motion regarding uh, the uh, granting of these funds. Councillor Pallad. Thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks, Chair Blackburn. Uh, I would make a motion that committee recommend council award $20,110.25 for community improvement grants as outlined in attachment A. Clayton. Thanks, uh, Chair Blackburn. Um, I will support this motion. I just want to make uh, it made public that um, going forward, I'd really appreciate to see more and more organizations from across the community apply. I think that uh, there's been some great work done here, and I would you know hope to see more uh, spread throughout the community as well. In other discussions we've had, there's some really organized, well organized pockets of our community uh, that do great work. And I would just hope that, uh, you know, next year maybe we can see some other areas that see some improvement. So thank you for your work, Ms. Melward. And um, I look forward to seeing these projects executed. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. I just wanted to say I really agree with Councillor Clayton and I would love to see that. And I just want to highlight to Council the recent conversations we've had about neighborhood associations and strengthening them and giving them a stronger mandate within our community. I know that it's, I don't, I don't think we've given neighborhood associations the attention that they deserve over the last couple of years and frankly over our council term. And I think this is a symptom of that. And so 100% agree. And I hope that us as council will make the pushes we need to push to enable our neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, Director Miller, I see you on the screen. Did you have a comment? No, sorry, Chair. I was just uh, getting ready for uh, the next uh, step. All right. 
thank you. Um, all right, I believe that, uh, is there any more discussion on this uh, question? Okay, I'll call for the vote then, please. All in favor? Thank you, we have uh, unanimous um, approval for that. And uh, thank you to Ms. Millward and Ms. Bieberdorf for helping us through this. Thank you. All right, um, I see no other business, uh, no bylaw and policy review. So the next thing would be the outstanding items list. Um, Director Miller. Uh, thanks, Chair Blackburn. So right now our, our list has uh, zero items on it. So, uh, so I'm pleased to say that. And uh, no requirement to add anything today. So I'm uh, going to have a motion to approve this uh, list. Thank you, uh, Councillor Palat. Yeah, so moved, Chair. And uh, all in favor? All right, everything has been passed unanimously today. Uh, Councillor Clayton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, before we switch chairs, I just want to announce that I'm, I need to leave the meeting, but I'm not on any of the upcoming agendas as a voting member, but I will be stepping away. Thank you. Thanks for letting us know that. All right, I'll call this meeting adjourned and uh, move on to who's going to be next. Looks like it's the Brian show. <laughs> All, right. All right. I won rock, paper, scissors, so I will go first. And I like how Director Glavin knew I was going to win. And so he I knew I was going to pick first. And I appreciate the vote of confidence from the director of my committee. Anyways, I will call the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee meeting to order. Uh, in chambers on the, on the committee, I've got Councillor Blackburn and myself. And Councillor Thiessen is the other voting member of this committee, and I see he is on Zoom. And then also in chambers, as non as council members who are welcome to participate but aren't voting members, I've got Councillors Palat, Friesen, Minhas, and O'Toole. And item 1.1, Director Service Update. That is Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair Bressy. We'll start off with economic development. Um, so economic development held uh, three virtual sessions and one in-person session uh, to explain the effect on businesses for the mandatory mask bylaw. Uh, in total, there were 53 businesses that registered for the online sessions. And uh, at the in-person session, there were 15 uh, business owners at the Prairie Mall that attended. Uh, as well, the economic recovery grant has currently uh, had 16 local marketing grants worth $45,945 awarded with total project value of approximately $110,000. Uh, as well, we've had eight beautification grants worth uh, roughly $110,000 and represent a total amount of investment of $486,000. Uh, based on uh, discussion recently at Council, we have uh, launched the Facade Improvement Grant and for the downtown incentives and applications are available at cityofgp.com uh, slash downtown incentives. For advertising and promotions, uh, economic development sponsored an ad at last week's PBR Canada uh, Canadian Championships event. Uh, the 92nd spot played throughout the event's online coverage and will play on TSN. Uh, and uh, when we have the uh, High quality link uh, will uh, likely play it for committee at uh, the next committee meeting. Uh, with regard to Get in the Loop, uh, that's through the chamber, uh, they currently have 1,875 local downloads, 27 local partners, and four national partners. Uh, and they'll soon be launching the city center loop to highlight downtown businesses. In energy and environment, um, one of the interesting things that uh, perhaps most people will. Uh, is on the energy side of it, uh, we have an energy analyst that goes through and checks for any inconsistencies or anomalies within uh, billing. And uh, we ended up having a gas meter failure at one of our facilities uh, that cost us $85,000 in fees that we shouldn't have paid. And due to their diligence, uh, uh, we've got a credit for that $85,000 back. So I uh, thought that was uh, an interesting thing to point out that uh, going back to 
uh, things like internal controls and accounting. Uh, this is an internal control that we have within uh, our energy expenses. Uh, in engineering services, we posted uh, the Bear River Outlaw Repair RFP uh, for five locations. Uh, as well, we've just recently closed the 2021 slope repair program uh, where there's five sites along bridges uh, throughout Bear Creek uh, that we'll be doing some work on next year. Uh, road construction has wound up. Uh, the final project uh, that still has a little bit of work left to do, but not within the actual road right of way is on 108th Street and 89th Avenue over by Canfor. Uh, they're just finishing up the uh, box culvert work that they're doing there. And then the traffic signal poles that are currently flashing yellow uh, when the final east-west light is put back up, those will go back to normal operation. Uh, hopefully over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and Aqua Terra's project on 84th Avenue has been uh, completely filled in and repaved with the exception of a pathway. Uh, and that pathway will be repaved in the spring. In transportation, all of our equipment has been converted for snow removal uh, and uh, all of the necessary materials and staff are in place and ready to go. And as it's snowing out there today, we're, uh, we're prepared for anything we need to do. Uh, in parks, we've started our winter tree pruning, uh, and this involves deadwood removal, structural shaping, and uh, elm pruning on the city's 25,000 trees. And for winter rinks, uh, we've created a more pronounced oval at uh, Montrose Concourse uh, for uh, skating this winter across from City Hall. So hopefully that will give some people some opportunity to uh, do some physically distanced activities in the downtown core. Uh, as well, we are currently delivering and setting up neighborhood rinks, and that program continues to accept applications until December 15th. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you, Director Glavin. Are there any questions? All right. I think you're off the hook for that, which, and then I don't see any other business or any bylaw or policy review, so that takes us to our outstanding items list. Okay, and uh, right now everything is on track in the outstanding items list. I think we're going to have a bylaw uh, for review come to the next committee a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, and uh, other than that, I think uh, everything is good to go on the outstanding items list. Great. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Thank you, Director Glavin. Good report. Um, I'm just curious, uh, which uh, bylaw might be coming forward to our next meeting? Is it the Water and sanitary sewage or the parks bylaw? Uh, cemetery, which is part of the old parks bylaw review. Perfect. Awesome. I, I would make a motion to approve uh, the outstanding items list. Great. We've got a motion. Any discussion or debate? In that case, I will call it to question. All in favor? And that passes unanimously. And with that, I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Oh my. Okay, so do we. All right, I guess with that, uh, that's probably the quickest uh, chair I've ever meeting I've ever seen, Mr. Bressy chair. But uh, we'll move on to the Protective and Social Services Committee agenda for today. Uh, myself will be the, uh, as the chair with Councillors Fries and O'Toole and Mayor Gibbon as, uh, as other members of this committee. Um, we did have a delegate that, that come in late, so we'll, we'll ask if they're available to maybe start with our delegate, and then we'll move into our normal report. So if there's somebody here from the Anhart Community Housing Society, um, maybe let, give us a wave and maybe IT can let you in and we can, uh, we can let you present. Uh, yes, I believe we have Mukhtar uh, Latif. This is Keith Weeb, but I think Mukhtar Latif was going to speak. Are you on Mukhtar? You're on mute, Mukhtar. Hi, thank you, Keith. Um, yes, um, thank you for um, inviting us to, to council to speak at short notice. Um, we wanted to um, just give you a little bit of background on the work that Anha has been doing and then uh, speak to you about the program that CMHC have just launched a couple of weeks ago um, to um, provide some rapid housing um, to address some of the challenges that uh, communities are facing, particularly around COVID, um, but generally on the lack of affordable housing. 
um, in, in, in many communities across Canada. Um, ANHA has been um, in affordable housing for the last 20 years, um, working in community-based organizations, supporting um, neighborhoods in BC. Um, and about three years ago, um, we felt that there was a need to, to create more housing supply. Obviously, with the national housing strategy, we, 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 we felt that there was an opportunity now to look at a way in which we could scale up um, the delivery of affordable housing. And we've been working with many communities um, across Canada, but particularly from uh, Northwest Ontario to, to BC, um, engaging with communities to, to find out what their needs are um, and how we could help address those. Um, we, we just um, completed a project about six months ago in Hope, BC, which was a small community of about 6,000 people. Um, and it was the first project that CMHC funded through their rental construction finance initiative. It was a modular build. Um, and we were able to, to convince at that time, um, CMHC to, to, to fund that project. And um, subsequently, um, we have now seen uh, a program from CMHC that's encouraging modular build um, across the country um, and have allocated a billion dollars to that effect. Um, the billion dollars is allocated on, on the premise that it will be spent to uh, create some rapid housing, which is why modular is the form of um, construction that they're looking for for new build. Um, but they are also um, funding uh, projects which are the acquisition of existing properties which will enable new housing, affordable housing to, to be um, utilized as well as repair of existing buildings. Um, half of that money has been already allocated to the large cities. So 15 of the largest cities have already got $500 million of the billion dollars. Um, and the, the rest of the $500 million is now available for um, applications, um, which um, at the moment the deadline is the end of December. However, the, um, we're hearing that the cities are likely to be, well, they are, are due to put their investment plans in by the end of November, and they're likely to be asking for more than the $500 million. Um, so from our perspective, uh, aside from the fact that we saw this as a great opportunity to um, bring forward the conversations that we were having with Grand Prairie over the past year on how we could uh, work with the community to create affordable housing. Um, we felt that this was a great opportunity to put a pilot program together. So ANHA is putting a program of 10 projects across um, the Western Canada from North Northwest Ontario to, to, to BC. Um, and is looking for community partners who want to work with us to, to create that supply. Um, and we've been speaking to the, the staff at Grand Prairie um, and we have, uh, and, and, and to the mayor, and we have had a good response to, to the approach that we've been taking. So we're now um, coming to council to ask for um, a letter of support um, to help us submit a, a proposal to, to CMHC to fund a development of approximately, I think at the moment we're looking at 40 units. Um, but it could be more. Um, it is 100% funded by CMHC, so it does give us the opportunity to move quickly. Um, and we're at the moment looking at some sites in Grand Prairie, but we, we do need to tie down a, a, a site as well as obviously have the support of council to expedite any planning process that we may have to go through in order to, to achieve the deadline. Um, the timetable to deliver is 12 months from the date that CMHC approves the, 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 the funding. Um, so it's a fairly short time scale, and that's on the back of obviously um, modular build being a lot faster, but it does take a lot of things into account, including obviously permissions and, and site conditions. So I can leave it at that for now and uh, obviously um, answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you for that. I'll just look around uh, council chambers. Any questions for the delegate? No, I, I, I guess I just have one. Um, you're looking at a 40 unit approximately. Have you, have you procured land in Grand Prairie? Do you have a site that you're looking at specifically right now? 
we, we're speaking to um, realtors. Um, we did have, um, uh, we, we need approximately 1.5 acres for that kind of development. Um, and, and we're just reaching out to realtors and any landowners that may have that size of land available for us. So we're, we're doing that um, um, as, we, as we speak, actually. We're reaching out to, to realtors this week to try and see if we can find a parcel of land. Okay. I uh, have a Councillor Friesen has a question here. Um, thank you, Chair Paulette. Um, so I, I did a little looking around your website last night, and uh, I saw that you have a variety of um, units that you've done from micro suites to uh, more apartment style. And I'm just wondering, um, first of all, why you are presenting to Grand Prairie. So why, you, you mentioned you're looking at 10 communities, I think, or 10 projects, and um, just what, what drew you to Grand Prairie. Uh, also, what types of um, suites or types of apartments that you had in mind for our community, and how did you arrive at that, or is that all TBD? No, no, we've been doing a fair amount of work um, and engaging. Um, obviously, we are aware of your affordable housing strategy and the needs that you have in the community. Um, so I think one of the things that we've been looking at is um, communities that have identified the needs um, because that helps us obviously focus in on um, providing the housing that's required with, uh, with the community. So um, uh, we, we have gone out and, in, and, and visited many of the communities, including Grand Prairie, over the past year, 18 months. And I think it was the, um, the, the, the uh, support that we felt that we got from Grand Prairie to pursue the, the approach, because we, we were looking to develop affordable housing outside of this initiative um, is just more of a challenge because we use social impact investment to, to bridge the funding gap. Um, so we've been looking at ways in which we could develop affordable housing um, without um, sort of grants coming in from government. Um, we have been using CMHC low financing, which helps, but uh, there's always an equity gap that we have to find. Um, so yeah, so we've been developing a number of models and it's just the uh, a great opportunity at this moment in time to 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 work with uh, municipalities that uh, need, uh, need that um, housing in their communities and, and want to 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 work with us. Um, so that's the reason why we are, we we we're at council today is because we had good support from from staff to to take this initiative forward. Um, in terms of the, the accommodation now, obviously there's a whole wide range of needs out there and we're not going to be able to address them all in this one project. Um, what we, we've seen is that we would like to have a mix of units in the, the building. Um, so we look at, so the mix we, we, we will be looking at, because one of the things that we're trying to do as part of the modular program, because we're looking to build 10, is to uh, sort of, um, have a design that sort of fits with most communities. And we're looking at smaller uh, studios and large studios um, for seniors, for, for couples, for young um, working people that are on low incomes or low to moderate incomes, um, and also two bed and three bedroom apartments. Um, so, we, so, in, in a, so we probably look at a fairly high mix of, we probably talk about 10% will be three beds, but 20% would be two beds and about, and the, and the balance will be the, the smaller units uh, because we find that that is the, where the greatest need is at the, the lower income bands. Um, not to say that we can't change that as we, as we move forward. The idea is that we engage uh, with the, the community and the municipality with that first project, understand what those needs are and then obviously work out how we can then expand and grow the program. Um, we do find that um, uh, we, we, the 40 units from an operational point of view is an efficient number um, because it allows us to, to be, provide uh, efficient management um, services. And then we like to get to about 200 units um, within about five years. So it's a long-term commitment to the community um depending on the needs i mean that could be faster or shorter depending on funding and need um but we are looking to have a long-term relationship with the community 
uh, Councillor O'Toole. Yes, thank question? you very much for presenting today. Uh, my question is, would you build a community or would you place some of these units in infill throughout the city? So um, we're currently looking at um, building um, on a parcel of land. So it will be a new build project rather than um, smaller infill sites um, for now. As I said, it's really part of the program. We're hoping that once it's seen to be a success that we can move into phase two, which will extend that uh, program to, to other, other needs. Um, so, and when we say develop a community, we, 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 we also, part of the reason why we have that mix of units is because we look to have a diversity in, in, in the building. So there is a, um, a strong community built within the, the building as much as it engages with the broader community as well. Um, so we do encourage uh, both the community within the building as well as outside. And we are working um, with a, a local uh, partner as well to see how we can get support um, from local agencies um, who can work with us as we, we, we build more homes. Okay, I just got I uh, your question. Just got one more question. Uh, the homes, can you give me a variety of the square footage that the homes would have, a including if they have a basement as well? Right. No, there won't be no. There won't be a basement. Um, they, the studios will range somewhere between 320 square feet to about 400 square feet. There will be a range of types there. Um, the two beds will be somewhere between 650 and 720 square feet, and the three beds will be around about 850 to, to 900 square feet. Okay. Uh, when the time comes, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Councillor O'Toole. Uh, Councillor Blacker. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your presentation. I, I guess the one thought that occurred to me, since this is something that's going to be, uh, you want to move on rapidly, in your research in the community, did you have a look at whether or not there would be any rezoning required in order to use the properties that you want to, uh, that you want to uh, build on? The, the, at the moment, we're looking at um, multifamily sites um, to see w whether we can acquire those. Um, but it does depend on what is available, and we'll be in t contact with, with staff as we identify sites to see what planning, think about those uh, prior to, to committing to, to a particular project. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Palat. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Mr. Lada. Uh, just a quick question. In your discussions with our administration, uh, was there anything uh, brought up in regards to uh, other projects that are planned within the area for affordable housing? I think notably like the youth emergency shelter or medical model uh, build that we've, we've been discussing with the neighborhoods recently. Um, has there been discussion that potentially supporting this uh, this project for affordable housing uh, may impact funding of other grants that the city or other organizations have applied for here locally? Yeah, um, I mean, this, um, this initiative is a new funding stream. Um, it's very particular around the, 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 the um, kind of housing that it's looking for and the demographic it's looking to, to house. So it shouldn't impact on any of your other programs. Um, so in, in, what would this can potentially do is obviously create an element of flow. Um, so some of the um, other existing um, properties or buildings that you have, which are under pressure, I'm just going to understand that many, many um, nonprofits are facing uh, difficulties in, 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 in moving people through their housing at the moment. And this will allow them to, to find some safe, stable housing um, for some some of the, the shelters and, and I know particularly some of the women shelters are, are struggling to, to find room. Um, so if people can move into a safe, secure accommodation, it does free up space uh, for, for others to, to be able to be housed. Okay, uh, but uh, do you think it would, uh, th there's a potential we might apply for it through the same new grant stream. Do you think that uh, a government or CMHC might look at it like, uh, well, there's, 
there's lots of projects here and just give a little bit to each project rather than a lot to one or two? I, like, is there the, is it possible that we could be competing against each other? I, I, not unless you fund it going through this funding stream. This is a totally new funding stream. Um, so I, I, those programs may not be part of this. I mean, the, 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 um, one of the criteria under this program is that the operating dollars have to be supportable. Um, and therefore, the, the, the project that we're looking at would be self-sustaining. So it wouldn't be looking for operating dollars from um, any other source, which I uh, think addresses some of your concern because we wouldn't be uh, seeking those dollars that you probably need uh, for some of those other programs. Okay, thanks for your answer. I'm a big, uh, big supporter for affordable housing and meeting the needs of people. So I appreciate yeah. uh, what you just said there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, looking around council chambers, I don't see any more questions. I, I do have a question, but it's, um, I'm hoping the delegate can stay on while I ask administration because we are, you, you were asking for us to some, for some support on this. And I think for me to support it, I just would like to ask administration a question if possible. So if I could ask just director Manuel, um, from his conversations with, with Mr. Mukhtar, does, does he feel that this could potentially be a conflict for the funding that we're looking at as we are trying to move forward with several projects in Grand Prairie? Uh, so I'll provide some clarification. I believe it's uh, actually Reed uh, DeRoche that's uh, been the contact for administration. So I haven't had any direct correspondence myself. But uh, to answer some of the questions that council members are asking, I am aware of at least two to three other projects in the city seeking this funding source and, uh, and also looking for municipal support. Thank you for that. And I, and I guess I'll just, I'll call my own number on this and I'll ask a question for the delegate here. I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, appreciate that there's an appetite from our council. And I think most people in chambers have been asking questions because we do have an appetite, appetite to get some more housing stocks for different affordable options. Um, you're asking for a letter of, of support. I guess where I'm struggling a little bit is I'm just wondering what we're supporting you on. You, you talked a lot about a lot of different models. You, you haven't secured a piece of land. I'm just wondering what we'd be supporting you with that letter on, I'm, I'm, if you can maybe clarify that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the support we're looking for at this stage is um, uh, the fact that if, if we have a, a project in Grand Prairie that uh, council would help expedite the, the planning process um, because we uh, are on a time um, constraint to deliver the project. Um, and also to consider, uh, and like I said, there's more consideration um, for any waiving of development fees or um, charges or taxes that might impact on the, the affordability for, for the building going forwards. But um, the CMHC obviously would like to see some commitment from council for these projects as well. Um, and it just helps um, with the waiting uh, when we present those to, to CMHC. But the key, key support that we're looking for at the moment is really um, an in-principle support for the initiative and, and working with us as well as um, supporting the expediting of permit, permitting. Um, any further questions from committee? Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Councilor Platt, thanks. thanks. Oh, and, and sorry, I didn't see your hand up there, Mayor, Mayor Gibbon, but uh, please go ahead. I'll come back to you, uh, Councilor Minhas, after. Okay. Thank, thanks, Councilor Platt. So, the, you know, this is for Director Manuel. Um, Director Manuel, I appreciate we have a number of different projects that are under consideration or proposed. Is there a way that Council can see them all at once? Uh, you know, we are sort of dealing, I feel like we're dealing with them a bit in isolation. And so has administration, uh, has administration or can administration uh, find some way to put them together uh, in some sort of format where we can review them all? Uh, you know, I, I appreciate that we would want to be certain about the funding streams that we're applying for, uh, that we have a clear understanding of, of whether they are in competition with one another or not. Um, we probably want to understand the state of readiness uh, of, of the different projects. I mean, we, we need to ensure that we do the best we can to maximize the resource coming in. That may mean that we have to be more strategic rather than just saying, yes, we support everything, and then potentially getting something that wasn't our top priority. So do you have any advice for us on how we could have a better view of the system and all the different projects that are being proposed um, today? Uh, 
certainly. So my suggestion was going to be that we make a motion to uh, move this matter to council on Monday. And at that time, we can uh, have a brief in-camera session about the proposals because some of them aren't our proposals. Some of them are other uh, private bodies as well. Uh, so we can have at least a discussion there and then come out. Uh, but at a just at a municipal level, though, our permanent supportive housing pr proposal, this was one of the identified funding sources for it. So there, there is um, some that council are aware of and there's some that uh, uh, on the private side that you would not be. Now, certainly this is the first one that's coming forward with a formal ask and I uh, obviously will want to respond uh, to that in a timely manner because there is time sensitivities. That's, that satisfies you, Mayor Gibbon? Or do you have any follow-up with that? Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Minhas. Thank you, Mayor Chairman. Uh, my question was similar to Mayor already asked it, but how many projects we can do it? Well, we are wide open, and I also I need to clarification. Is the time limit and we have to do it before December 31st, or that money is available after that? And how many units we can build in Grand Bay as we got two, three projects already on the line. It's still, we have room to do more. Uh, Director Manuel, did you wanna? Um, so what, uh, what I can speak to is similar to um, what the delegation has indicated. This was part of a, a billion dollar um, grant fund that uh, the federal government put forward for rapid housing primarily to address the oversaturation of um, shelters and to get people into more appropriate accommodations for the long term. So $500 million has already been allocated to the 10 communities identified as having the most need. That means that the rest of the country has access to $500 million. The proposals all have to be submitted by December 31st, and we're told that they will be evaluated in the month of January. So um, certainly there's not a cap on the number of proposals that can come from a community, but they are all evaluated and scored against each other. And uh, there is criteria such as municipal support and uh, in what impact that will have on the needs for that community that will change that scoring. Uh, seeing no further hands up in chambers. Um, uh, oh, Councillor O'Toole, sorry. Yeah, if it's okay, Mayor Give or uh, Councillor Pilot, uh, I would like to make a motion, and I move that this be referred to Council and Administration to discuss at the uh, soonest available time. Okay, that's in order. Um, any conversation or yeah. conver on, on that yeah. motion? Yeah, Councillor Plot, if I, if I can. Councillor Tool, is your intention to refer it to the Monday Council meeting? Or it, you said refer to administration and Council to discuss. So um, are you meaning to the Monday meeting. create some other new opportunity to, to talk about that? Or are you looking to forward it to the Council meeting so we can be in a position to make a decision about it? Yes, Monday meeting. Okay. So, so uh, is that like a refer this request to Monday's council meeting motion? Is that is that what you're meaning? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so just uh, Councillor Plot, just to sp speak to that, uh, I support the the motion to recommend it forward. I think we need to move this through uh, for the benefit of everybody so that we can get uh, some clarity. I just I guess a request to administration. I don't think it needs to be a part of the of the uh, motion, but just really for Director Manuel to, to bring us what you know today of the other projects that are going on so that we can really start to get a view of the system and, and um, the, uh, yeah, the, the ones that are going in so we can hopefully uh, have some sense of, of where this request uh, may fit in with other requests that are before us or other projects. Uh, so we can try to make sure that we're, we're prioritizing the right things that are the, the most acute challenges in the community. Thanks for that clarification, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. I hope the committee passes and we get to discuss it on Monday and I look forward to having that conversation about other local projects too. 
the same time, I hope that council will, I know that there's maybe a tendency amongst some to say, well, we need to, we need to think about the local projects support what's going on locally at the same time. I think there might be a lot of value having somebody with experience in other municipalities and experience from outside our community doing a project here too. And there's a, I don't know a lot about this organization. I want to learn more, but it, there's a different approach. It seems that there is a different approach here than what I've seen in Grand Prairie. And it might actually be very beneficial for other local projects to have some different thinking in town too. So I just hope as we go this, we definitely should weigh this against the local projects. But I hope that as we weigh that, there's not a there's not a predisposition to say we want to support the local ones that have been going over anything else. That we really think about what value could a new player to town bring as well. No, I, I agree with you, uh, Councilor Brasserland. I think for me, I, I'm, I'm feeling the same. I'd love to see a little bit more information before I'd want to fully support this. But I think you know, hopefully, the proponent or the, the delegate can maybe get some stuff to our council inboxes before our meeting on Monday, so we have a little bit more understanding of what the projects they're looking at doing. But uh, I think it's it's a good start, and I definitely would like to see. Like Councilor Bressy mentioned there's skill sets outside of our region sometimes that we need to draw upon. This this could be an organization that has that, so it would be a great fit. So, uh, seeing no other hands up in chambers here, I will call the question. All those in favor? And sorry, I just I can't see Mayor Given on the screen. I don't know if you. Sorry. I'm here. So, I'm in favor. Okay, we're we're all in favor, so that passes unanimously. And I'd like to thank. Uh, uh, Keith and, and Mukhtar from uh, Anhart Community Housing Society to come in and be a delegate today and bring some more awareness of, uh, of organizations that are looking at coming to our city and, and looking at our community for opportunities. So thank you for taking the time to come in and speak to us today and hopefully we'll have further conversations with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. you have, a, have a great day, gentlemen. Um, from there, we're just going to move on to uh, our director's uh, servo, service verbal up, or area verbal update. Um, uh, Director Manuel, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, actually, I do want to take an opportunity to, again, thank Ann Hart for, for bringing this forward and for our housing team in administration for working with them over the past year to, to have something to bring forward. So it is nice to see that in the background over the last year, some things are happening. But uh, on another note, uh, community social development, I can report that uh, the Youth Advisory Council orientation slated for November 17th. Uh, myself and Mayor Given will be attending to uh, welcome the new council and uh, and provide an overview of how we see them fitting into our uh, uh, council and administrative priorities. In enforcement services, their focus in November is going to be on abandoned vehicles. Um, officers are going to be combing through city streets to identify abandoned vehicles that uh, adversely affect our snow removal operations. So um, just a, a message for folks out there that, uh, you know, please make sure that uh, your vehicles are being moved every uh, 72 hours. The G-PREP uh, G -PREP continues to monitor the uh, ever-changing COVID-19 situation in the province and uh, continues to make contingency plans around uh, various scenarios. Uh, the fire department had experienced two separate uh, positive COVID-19 cases, but uh, we can report that uh, due to the actions that were immediately taken to isolate the exposed staff and deep cleaning that occurred, um, uh, essentially operations were able to continue without impact. And at this point, uh, all personnel have returned um, back to duty uh, COVID-free. Additionally, uh, the RCMP, um, the COVID impacts of the RCMP detachment have now concluded with all members, municipal employees having returned to work. Um, they have identified uh, in their report that there was a significant occurrence that occurred on October 22nd in Grand Prairie where the RCMP reported, um, received a report of a dispute in progress and upon arrival, the police located and arrested an individual involved who was also the subject of an incident from October 17th in which he allegedly entered a residence and pointed a firearm at another person. Uh, during their investigation, they seized several firearms and ammunition, as well as an assortment of various identification documents, which were determined to be stolen. As a result uh, of both occurrences, an individual was charged 
with possession of a weapon for a dangerous purpose, unauthorized possession of a firearm in a motor vehicle, point in a firearm, unauthorized possession of firearms times four, failure to comply with 28 separate conditions, possession of government identity documents times five, possession of fraudulent documents times six, and knowingly unauthorized possession of a firearm and possession of stolen property under 5,000. Um, following a bail review, he was released from custody, but set to return to court October 28th. And that's the report. Okay. Well, that was an interesting tale. Thanks for that, uh, Director Manuel. Um, any questions for Director Manuel? Uh, Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Uh, Director Manuel, you kind of left us hanging there. Did he attend his court date on the 28th of October, or do you know that? Uh, he did, but he remains out of custody. Uh, I think the emphasis there was, I think the RCMP were pointing out, you know, they're, they're taking the calls for service. This is clearly a person that in the community is uh, having a significant amount of interaction with the police, but, um, you know, outside of their um, actions they've taken thus far, he remains at his own liberty pending his future trial date. That, that's good, and it was good to hear uh, that that happened, and that happened also while, uh, um, if my timeline is right, it happened also while um, the uh, COVID isolations were happening with the RCMP, so I really appreciate that uh, our members, um, you know, stepped up and, and helped each other out during a time when uh, many of them were not able to be at work. So thanks for that report. Thanks for that. Any other questions for Director Manuel? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to our outstanding items list as presented here. Okay, in reference to the outstanding items list, uh, everything remains on target. It looks like our next PSS meeting will uh, be a little longer than today's. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just wondering when I look at the outstanding items list there on the, lot of the last item, there's no expected reporting date. Do we have an update on that? Uh, so at, at this point, there's been no real update provided on the um, transitional I guess, uh, processes that are going to be in play there. So uh, no, there, there really is no further information at this time. Okay. Seeing that, uh, oh, so yeah. Mayor Gibbon. Yeah, Councillor Plot, no, uh, thanks, for, thanks for raising that one. I wonder, uh, Director Manuel, maybe even just putting a, a date on and then, and, you know, that way there's sort of, uh, and not, not that that report would be expected on that date, but that at least sort of serves as a check-in uh, and administration can say, yeah, you know what, here's the current status, nothing has changed. And, and Council can either, you know, choose to bump the date forward again or say, you know what, then let's strike this off the list. But let, let's put another, let's put a date on there um, that is just sort of the next check-in point rather than floating without a date. Uh, what would you advise, you know, um, three months into the new year or? So my suggestion is actually going to be if we put um, March, and the reason I say March is because that will give us, um, we'll have insight as to the provincial budget at that point. And I suspect that the provincial budget is going to heavily drive this um, initiative. So I, I don't know what the March calendar looks like, but uh, or when there might be committee. Just off the top, I don't have it in front of me. But you know, so Councillor uh, Chair Plot, you know, if we said March fifteenth or something like that, you know, sort of pick the middle of the month. Yeah, that works for me. If that works for Director Manuel, I think it's a good call to have a date on there, just so we have a check-in point. So, um, any other conversation around the outside of my name list? Seeing none, uh, all in favor of accepting? Oh, sorry, I can't make the motion, so I need a motion for somebody to make that motion. Councillor Friesen. <laughs> Thanks, so I'll move to accept the outstanding items list as presented. Thank you, Councillor Friesen. I got a little ahead of myself. better motion. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all in favor of the motion? And again, sorry, uh, for some reason, Mayor Given, you're not popping up in chambers here. Just how do you, you're in favor? Okay, thank you. Yeah, in favor. 
Okay, and with that, um, that is unanimous and that uh, closes off our protective and social services committee agenda. Thank you for your support today, uh, Director Manuel. We will move over to corporate services. Oh, actually we're just, in council chambers, we're just requesting a, a five minute break here as it's been a couple hours. So we'll do a five minute break. We'll put, we'll start at, uh, let's call it 10.55.
have to just uh, see the mic. Oh. Well, it's time lab uh, 1055, uh, and I think we got all in the council because Jackie's uh, out of service today. And Bill Mayor Gavin should be around. So I don't see it, but. Yep, all here. Oh, you're here. Thank you, Mayor. So this is Cooperative Service Committee meeting agenda today, and uh, we are uh, myself and uh, Unifreesen and uh, Kevin O'Toole and Mayor Bill Gibbon. And we start with this meeting, Director Services Update, Barbell, Shane Broke, you're on the line again. Uh, thank you, Chair Minhas. Um, with uh, budget this Thursday and Friday, I'll keep this short as we'll be uh, we'll be uh, talking a lot about uh, what's happening in corporate services here at the end of the week. But uh, I did want to highlight that uh, we've we've made a concerted effort to provide council with uh, the necessary info to make budget decisions, but also also with a focus to uh, to make it accessible to the public. I think any time that we can uh, inform the public about city operations, uh, we should take advantage of that. So. We're very proud of the uh, the budget material we've presented and, and the budget as a whole for council to consider this week. Uh, finance will also be pr providing a Q3 update later in the meeting. Uh, we want to do that in advance of budget to know uh, where our fiscal position was at. And uh, finally, I just uh, highlight uh, some of them have been mentioned already, but procurement is really focused on uh, making sure that our uh, MSP and ICEP uh, funding, which is related to stimulus uh, projects, are, are uh, going to market so that we can uh, um, have the best chance of success in completing the next year and in securing those funding. And with that, that's my update today. Thank you, Shane. Is there any question on Shane's update? I don't see it any. Thank you very much, Shane, again. Uh, the next agenda is uh, we're skating on the stormwater retention ponds. Shelly Carpy. Shelby. Good morning. Where are you? Uh, here. <laughs> oh, there you I'm go. On. Thanks, Shelby. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, on October 5th, Council heard a request from a community member to consider the use of stormwater retention ponds as skating rinks in the city. In 2019, the city of Grand Prairie managed and maintained, sorry, 38 skating rinks. This included five high board hockey rinks low board skating rink, the oval at the Montrose Multicultural Center, and the pond at Muskogee Park. Additionally, the city offers neighborhoods the opportunity to apply for a rink within their subdivision through the Neighborhood Rink Program. Each subdivision has equal opportunity to apply, and in 2019, the city provided neighborhoods with the supplies for 26 rinks. With that being said, City Bylaw 1078, Use of Public Lands, states unauthorized use of public land shall include constructing and or maintaining a skating or hockey rink. The definition of public land under the bylaw includes public utility lots and stormwater management facilities. The city's transportation department places signage around stormwater retention ponds, advising community members of the fluctuation of water and prohibiting wading, swimming, boating, and skating. Stormwater retention ponds uh, reduce flooding within our neighborhoods and on our streets. The constant flow of water through the inlet and outlet pipes prevents water from freezing completely. They are designed to remain functional year-round. During the seasons where temperatures fluctuate, like yesterday being plus three, I'm not complaining, <laughs> the runoff into the stormwater ponds can include soil, or sorry, oil, salt, and other debris that can speed up ice melt. Other municipalities have taken the initiative to advise community members of the risk and liabilities surrounding stormwater retention ponds. The City of Calgary offers informative brochures and the City of St. Albert has information on their webpage. Administration performed hazard assessments on both stormwater retention ponds and community rinks for the purpose of skating. Due to the uncertainty around the freezing of stormwater retention ponds, the activity of skating scored higher in a, in a higher category than skating on public rinks maintained by the city. To finish, enforcement services provided feedback on the complications their department or their uh, their department receives during stormwater retention ponds and the spring ice melt. Uh, community members have called in advising nets and benches are left on the ice and have not been removed. Enforcement must then engage the fire department, parks, and transportation 
As the ice is thin and having a member venture onto it to confiscate items left requires training and proper gear. The fire department is typically not called to rescue items off of a pond, and this is leaves enforcement to follow up with whomever the items belong to. There is members from the city's parks department, I believe, transportation and engineering, uh, along with me today to answer any questions the chair may have. Thank you very much, Shelby. Uh, any question on this report? No. So we do need the motion then. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Eunice. Um, thank you, Chairman Hess. So I would like to move that uh, community sir, the, the Corporate Services Committee receive this report for information. And um, just, you know, as, as much as I would love, I, I get how um, just the, the charm, the beauty, the, the how, you know, that kitsch factor of skating on a pond is, but um, this is a liability for the city and I and I really hope that uh, this community has applied for and takes advantage of our community skating rink uh, uh, program and uh, I wish them many happy hours on the ice but uh, I do move that we receive for information thank you motion is on the table go ahead Kevin to yeah I would just like to thank the Shelby for such a uh, very informative report. Uh, there's stuff there that I had no idea that we even had to consider. So uh, thank you. And if there's any concerns with this gentleman that, uh, that asked, uh, I would ask him to maybe read this report and that might soften the blow a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice and Kevin. Any other question on this? Councilman Haas. Go ahead, Mayor. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I think this actually might be for Director Bork. Uh, if a uh, committee receives this for information, uh, that means we sort of are accepting uh, the information that administration provided, that uh, we're not choosing to propose any change. How will administration follow up with the resident that initiated this request? Shane, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Minhas. Um, uh, legislative services will be in contact uh, with the individual to uh, to share the the outcome of the meeting as well as the uh, the content of the report. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I just uh, ask. It's important. You know, this was initiated by the resident, and uh, I can appreciate. I, I like the rest of the council or committee uh, that's spoken so far. Think, consider the matter closed. Uh, and there's good reason why we don't allow it. Um, but I think that it's important that we that we close that loop, uh, considering that the resident took the time to come and present to council. So thanks very much for that, Shane. Uh, so I'm also in support of the motion. No other question. And all in favor? Oh, Mayor, can see you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, unanimous. Thank you very much. Motion is done. And uh, next one point three. Third quarter financial update, Daniel, you're on the line. Thank you, Chairman Haas. Uh, good morning, committee. Uh, today we recommend that committee receive the unaudited financial statements and supporting information for the quarter ending September 30th of 2020. So I'll just uh, highlight a few items from the report. Uh, the city's next financial asset position has seen a significant uh, favorable increase when compared to this time last year. And this is with our financial assets increasing more than our financial liability. When we look at revenue collected as of September 30th, 2020, it is pretty similar to what was collected in 2019. Even though we saw shutdowns of facilities, cancellations of programs uh, due to COVID, um, we have seen some impacts to help reduce these revenue losses with growth to the city's tax base and some additional investment income above and beyond budget. The lower spending to date is also a result of COVID-19, again with facility closures and decreased operations, seeing significant salary savings. Um, there were some layoffs, delayed hiring, vacancies, and redeployment. In the prior year, the city also incurred significant great losses for refinancing many of the outstanding debentures. So this cost for interest costs last year to be $5 million greater than what we're seeing this year. 
So for the quarter ending September 30th, 2020, the city is anticipating a surplus by December 31st of around 886,000. This does equate to a 0.49% variance of the total city operating budget. The provincial government has also confirmed that the city will receive 7.4 million in funding to support COVID costs and lost revenue. However, this has not been included in the forecast as we do work to confirm some eligibility criteria and further details. This additional funding will be further discussed at budget deliberation and used to support strategies to protect the financial health of the city in the longer term. Included in the operating variance projection of the year end surplus, um, are the savings as a result of layoffs, reduced hours, redeployments, delayed hiring, turnover, and vacancies. Uh, as of September 30th, the year-to-date salary savings have been approximately 6.6 .6 million, and we are anticipating that this will grow to 9.2 million. Reserve balances have seen a decrease of 5.2 million from December 31st of 2019. At the beginning of 2020, the city had 55.7 million of capital funds available and assigned to approve projects. As of September 30th, 25.3 million has been spent for capital. And as projects continue to progress, we will still see more spending in the last quarter. The city does continue to pay down debt and not take any new long-term loans. Long-term debt at September 30th is 126 million. And we are well within uh, the legal debt limit at the end of 2019. During this quarter of 2020, 14 tenders were awarded over 250,000. This was for road rehab and overlay, sidewalks, the manhole repair projects, various equipment purchases in the downtown rehab phase four. Each quarter administration does track the number of active staff employed to the city. And at September 30th of 2020, the city has employed 731 staff in either permanent or temporary roles. This is compared to 780 at September 30th of the last year. So in conclusion, um, just the forecasted operating surplus uh, again is 886,000, which is an approximate variance of 0.49% of the city's total operating expenses. Thank you. Thank you very much for updating the quarter and any question for uh, Daniel? Wade, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chairman Haas. I really want to thank Danielle and uh, for this report. Uh, you know, on our term of council, this report continues to evolve and have more information, more data, which I think is great because it is a public-facing document that our community gets to see every quarter. I just do have one comment. I feel like I, I, I have to bring that. You know, I bring this up about every six months. But on uh, page 10 of the report, or, or page 67 of our package, when it talks about debt, um, and I, I, I would love to see us, you know, I've mentioned it a few times, but I'd still love to see us at some point put, we do have a, a policy that restricts the amount of debt we can we can actually take on. So, and here it's saying remaining debt limit. I've just always liked to show that there is a good governance that our city does have policy in place that restricts that to 80% to show what our actual debt ceiling is so the community does see it's not truly, nobody would have the appetite to take on that much debt, but even if we did want to, that it would actually be un unattainable. So. I'm just wondering if that's something administration is, is opposed to putting the document or, or just, you know, why, why it doesn't show up, I guess. Uh, Daniel or Shane? I think that's uh, certainly something, uh, Councillor Swat, that we can make more clear in the document of our 80% uh, policy. Yeah, I would, if, if we could, I'd much appreciate that because I think it has been discussed. And, and like I say, I think this report does get viewed now quite, I, I have members of the chamber and I've had other business people reach out and say they like to see this quarterly reporting, they like how it's evolving. Um, 
And I think any chance we can reference our policy and just to make it even more transparent, the better. So I'd, I'd much appreciate if we could add that. And other than that, I just want to thank you for how this continues to evolve and uh, how much more transparent it continues to get for our community. So much appreciated. Thank you, uh, Dylan. Yeah, it's, I want to echo that. I really do appreciate that we're being a lot more transparent with this, making it easier to read. Um, just a comment on page 13 of the financial report where there's uh, reimbursements to reimbursements to council and just a bug to put in administration's ear. I don't know if that really gives an accurate, it says travel expense reimbursements council. I don't know if that really gives uh, an accurate view of what this funding is. I think if, if a member of public of the public was to read this, they'd think, Oh, that's just spent for travel, not realizing that that's also anytime I go to a ticketed event in the community, that's what this budget comes out of. Um, I've been taking through AUMA and elected officials education program to make better. Right now I'm doing it on corporate finance so that I can be more informed going into budget and that comes out of this. And I think that there's a, I'd love to see a little bit of work done. I'd like, I'd love to see maybe that word travel taken out of the, out of the title and maybe a little bit more work done just to give an accurate view of what this is because I think that that money does get spent responsibly by council members to do better our job and be present in our local community. I don't know if this sheet is giving that accurate view of what that money's spent for. Daniel? Yeah, we we'll need to make sure to um, incorporate some of those comments into the quarter four report. Any other question? No? I had one, Daniel. Uh, you mentioned um, our funds are late MSI funds. Do that affect on our budget this year at all because we're getting delayed those funds in February? Um, is there any factor or they're just normal? I can wonder. Sorry for the MSI. Did you say MSI? I couldn't hear you very well. Yeah, MSI you fund, you said that we're going to be delayed. That's why we're receiving a little more. Is that affecting mm -hmm. our budget at all for this year? The cost um, so it, just, it just forces us to just watch our cash flow a little bit uh, closer with capital projects. So we have gotten approval for all of those 2020 projects that were submitted for MSI. The province is just holding back some of the money. So it just, we'll have to use a little bit of our own money for some of those projects rather than having it cash and bank in the fall like we normally do. So that maybe we didn't have to borrow money from the bank or any other places. So we use our own. Thank you. That's all. Shall we need the motion, please? All right. Eunice, you are the last. Okay. Thank you. So I will move that uh, council accept this report for information, or sorry, that um, committee receive the unaudited financial statements and supporting information for the quarter ending, ending September 30th, 2020. Motion on the table. Anybody had any question? If there's none, all in favor? In favor. Right on. Thank you, Mayor. Well, Governor, I see you this time. <laughs> it's unanimous. It's done. Thank you. And the next one is <clears throat> correspondence. And this is Alberta Municipal Affair. And I ask Shane to update this correspondence letter, please. Uh, Thank you, Chairman Haas. I uh, just wanted to uh, to uh, bring to uh, community's attention a letter that uh, was uh, sent to the mayor from the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Um, in, in it, it outlines that uh, from the province's view, there will be some difficult choices for the province to make to ensure uh, uh, financial our finances and sustainable uh, sort of finances are sustainable over the long term. And the province encourages us to make uh, certain that all of our capital spending is used to support critical infrastructure. Uh, administrations taking from this uh, letter uh, not to consider um, uh, future provincial grants as uh, guaranteed funding. Uh, we don't know what uh, that means, but uh, we we do uh, we are um, mindful mindful of this uh, this letter, as well as uh, for us to consider uh, in our long term or medium term planning the how we can best smooth out uh, funding sources for uh, mid midterm capital projects. 
Thank you, Shane, for updating. Any question for that thing correspondence? Do we need the motion on this one? Or? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Kevin Tool, and a motion on the table. Any question on this one? If it's not, go ahead, Dylan. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just curious. A uh, question for either committee or maybe Mr. Burke's got some insight into this. But it's, I know that informally we've done a really good. Our council has been very fiscally responsible even before the recent challenges that our entire province is facing. I mean, we're a council that, despite some pretty significant downloads from senior governments and ballooning RCMP costs, we've lowered taxes. And I know that informally we've done a good job of informing both our local ministers about the, about the fiscal responsibility we've taken. But I'm wondering if there might be value in receiving a letter like this, replying formally with highlighting some of the, the responsibility we've taken. And I don't know, it's just an idea. I don't know if there's merit there or not, but it just, we've, We've received a few formal correspondences saying, hey, you better tighten your belts. And I wonder if it might be worth formally saying, yep, we are partners in fiscal responsibility in this province. Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I just uh, want, you know, since it was sort of addressed to me, I, I'll just speak to it a little bit. Um, I appreciate Councillor Bressy's point. Um, you know, not every municipality has taken the actions the city has, of Grand Prairie has over the last while. Um, but, you know, this letter is a general letter that went to all chief elected officials. Uh, that being the case, I don't know that it, that it was really intended to elicit a conversation. I think, I think in, in, to be completely blunt, I think it's, uh, intended to be as much of a heads up and a, and a proactive warning uh, that the Minister of Municipal Affairs can give us uh, without disclosing any provincial budget confidence. I mean, you know, I think, I think that she is doing what she can to ensure that municipalities are prepared for the potential, and I probably would rate it high potential, that provincial grant funding in the next upcoming budget won't be what it was in, in the past one. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't take it so much as a, a uh, suggestion that the city of Grand Prairie specifically needs to do more. Uh, if it was that, I think I'd agree with Councillor Bressy. I think that this is intended to, to give us a heads up um, that we should sort of prepare ourselves. And, uh, you know, that, that being the case, um, you know, I, I think it really is just a receipt for information. I think we should do everything we can to inform our two MLAs about the work that we've done. Uh, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, but I, I don't think it, you know, I don't think this letter is sort of the initiation of that conversation. Thank you, Will. So any other questions, Will? No. So motion on the table, all in favor? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. And the next one is uh, 401, disclosure of wrongdoing and the reprisal protection provision basic blower basic blower so that's Shane can you update please this uh, thank you chairman Haas um, where uh, administrations bring forward uh, disclosure of wrongdoing and reprisal protection provisions uh, also known as uh, whistleblower provisions um, our recommendation is that uh, committee recommend recommend to council approval of this new policy 117 as presented this is the first bylaw or policy that's being reviewed in the new process to systematically review all bylaws and policies through the standing committees. So this is the, uh, the first one of this new process. Um, disclosure of wrongdoing reprisal protection policies are best practice for all public sector organizations. And us being here at the five year mark, it made uh, since the last amendments, this made sense uh, for this one to come forward at, the, at this time. Uh, administrations has completed a scan of municipal policies uh, in this in this uh, field from across Canada, and determined that while our existing bylaw by uh, whistleblower policy has the required elements, that there are areas of improvement that support transparency and can further build confidence uh, for employees and uh, with uh, community members. The key components of this new policy 117 are emphasis on the protection of employee whistleblowers, protection or procedures for resident complaints 
enhance processes for investigating complaints involving senior management, and inclusion of a reporting mechanism uh, uh, so that the community knows uh, the status and how this bylaw is working. Uh, key new procedures uh, in, included in this uh, policy are anonymous reporting. Employees in the general public may remain anonymous while reporting by utilizing our new online portal that's been built out. Uh, a key point here is that uh, there will be there will need to be enough information submitted uh, for there to investig a formal investigation to be initiated. Complaints involving employees will be sent to the city manager for review and, and investigation. Complaints involving the city manager direct or directors, um, those, uh, that form will be sent to the clerk who will inform the mayor. Uh, council will, be the deciding, uh, will decide whether to proceed with an investigation utilizing appropriate resources, including third party. Um, one amendment and some discussion has been whether both the mayor and the deputy mayor should be uh, notified uh, of such actions, um, but we have not included that uh, at this stage, but that would be an impossible amendment. Uh, each January, the city manager will report on the number of complaints, number of findings of wrongdoing, and how many open and closed investigations there are. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Shane. Uh, any question? Uh, Dylan, go ahead. Great, thank you, and thank you to administration. I really appreciate that this is the first policy coming through our bylaw and policy review committee. I think it says a lot about our administration that they've chosen to make this the first one that they that they flag for us in terms of our administration wanting to be a, accountable and responsible. So really appreciate that. Uh, really appreciate the um, flagging that maybe reports go to the mayor and deputy mayor. That was actually in my notes to suggest as well that I think committee should consider um, just. It, First, we're going to have a mayor without as much experience as our current mayor next next term, and it would be good for them to have a second voice, but also even what happens if a disclosure goes to the mayor when the mayor's on vacation, and it's a time-sensitive thing that should be dealt with, so I think that would be wise to have a second set of eyes on it. Um, a question that I did have about this is just in terms of reporting and investigating reprisal, how would this policy work if somebody made a complaint and it was the city manager that was targeting them as a for, was targeting them for reprisal reprisal uh shane uh the city manager is still accountable for for all employees and, and the, uh, the the operations of the municipality uh through the online portal though the if they click the box if anyone uh once they uh, open this if it says that this is a complaint, if the person wishes to make another anonymous complaint against the city manager, that uh, that goes only to the clerk who then would inform the mayor and possibly deputy mayor. Um, he wouldn't be uh, notified of that. Council would at least be aware of, uh, of that action. Right, so I just want to confirm that reprisal is just a different section in this than, than complaints, but somebody could still make a complaint about a repri reprisal, and I'm seeing a nodding head. Cool, I thought that's what it was, just wanted to... That just wanted to make sure. So yeah, just really appreciate administration's work on this. I really think that this is a good step forward. Thank you, Dylan. Any other question on this one? If it's not, can you get motion? Yunus? I can make the motion. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Mayor. Yeah, I, I was gonna make the motion that the committee recommend council um, approve the changes to policy 117 uh, with uh, one amendment uh, that the, both the mayor and deputy mayor be notified of uh, complaints uh, related to the city manager and or directors. I, I think that that's a useful addition. Um, I think that it also starts to provide the deputy mayor post, which we do on a rotation with a bit more, you know, uh, there's a bit more of a function to it, which I think is a, a good, good step. Um, and so I would move that the committee recommend council uh, approve the changes to policy 117, including that one addition. Thank you, Mayor. Well given. Motion is on the table. Any question on the amendment? If it's not, all in favor? In favor? Yeah, thank you very much. Motion carried unanimously. I guess um, our partner, Governor Tool, has to leave. You got a minute? Okay, then we can go outstanding item. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Minhas. Uh, once uh, administration uh, connects with uh, the resident who brought forward the skating on storm pond item, we will um, have uh, completed uh, 1118, and I will ensure that the, that occurs. Uh, the other two items are uh, on track as the dates uh, expected. 
Thank you very much. Are you going to move them open? Yes, if there's no other questions or concerns with the re outstanding items listed, I move to accept the outstanding items listed. Outstanding, outstanding items list as presented. Thank you. Governor. Tongue's not working so good today. <laughs> no, that's fine. All in favor? In favor. Or, you know, MC done. With that, we are done our day. And you guys have a good day and good work hard. Thank you. <laughs>